My name is Max Hahn. I'm the broker, owner, licensed partner of Angle Volkers, Collingwood, Muskoka. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for coming. This is our, I think, our fifth uh, senior seminar that we've done in the last six months. And uh, it's growing, getting bigger. Our, our ultimate goal is to have a full day event with uh, lots of lots of vendors and lots of speakers and uh, and talk about things that are important to all of you and to me. Um, issues that affect us, mm -hmm. not just from a real estate point of view, but from a uh, you know lifestyle point of view. I find now in talking to my clients that there's so many issues that um, are revolving around selling the house. Where do I go? And what about my finances? And how long am I going to live? <laughs> you know, how many more moves have I got left in me? So these are questions that we we try to dig deep and answer. And today we have a, a fantastic speaker um, who's going to talk about the issue of wills, estates, and and probates. And we've um, we sort of left that whole two-hour window just for John to speak because um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions that come up and. Um, we didn't want to uh, dilute it with, uh, with too many different topics today. So just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, please turn your cell phones off uh, so that we're not interrupted. Um, washroom is located at the end of the hallway, just outside the doors. Um, gift bags will be provided with materials and handouts. So you should have each um, received a bag like this. It's full of all kinds of information. Uh, the, the top sheets I'm just looking at right now are about uh, ASA Master ASA Pivotal Innovations, which uh, which is a you know course that I'm very involved with, um, taking my masters, and all of my uh, advisors and agents in my real estate organizations are taking their courses too because it's an area that we we as a company really want to focus on. So read that information. Um, the one piece that's not in there yet that I wanted just to bring to your attention is is something called um, oh god I'm having a moment here um, um, senior seniorcareaccess.com it's a new website that's just been launched in the last sixty days um, I will I will make sure that when we get the brochure made it is sent to you by mail or by email and. Senior Care Access is a giant database of, of, of services and, and um, centers that will help seniors with all kinds of issues, and mostly related to housing. Um, right now, if you, if you have a relative or uh, somebody that's being discharged from the hospital, they sort of let you go, and then it's up to you to go and you know, call around and, and, and find a, a place that will take care of your needs and so this is going to be one stop shop for um, for seniors looking for care services and a multitude of other things so very exciting just launched we don't have the brochures on it yet but we will make sure that they get out to you um, also in here uh, a little bit of information about us and our real estate company and um, uh, a book on uh, retiring um, this this gentleman is going to be one of our speakers uh, Dr. Riley Moynes, he's, uh, he wrote the book, you'll, you'll see it in there, it's a very interesting book, and he does a fantastic talk, by the way, on the four phases of retirement, so I think you'll really enjoy that. He'll be one of our upcoming speakers in the next couple of months, as soon as I can uh, get a hold of him and find out what his availability is. Um, so feel free to take down some notes um, and write down your questions, because at the end of the presentation, um, John will answer as as many questions as he can in the time that we have. Um, we will also have a couple of raffles for a beautiful planter courtesy of the Collingwood Garden Club and basket of goodies courtesy of Gerard Buckley, who's our uh, finance guru and expert. Um, in, in the next seminar, we've, we've had a tremendous number of requests for issues relating more about real estate. So the next seminar, which will be five or six weeks from now, uh, we'll send a notice out. There'll be lots of information about housing options and reverse mortgages and and you know, sell and stay, um, all kinds of things will, that will be related to housing issues. So stay tuned for that. But today our guest speaker is John Ferris from Ferris Selhofer Law Firm. 
and uh, he'll be presenting informative and valuable information about wills, probates, and estate planning. Uh, we'll be learning about uh, choosing your executor, executor's responsibilities, when is probate of will necessary, and what is the cost? What is a primary will and a secondary will? That's something I don't even know, so I'll be interested to hear about that. Advantages and disadvantages of joint ownership, and how validity of a will can be challenged, and by whom. So, the numbers across Canada, 50% of, of Canadians don't have a will. I don't think that's necessarily true in this room. I think it's, it's true of more of an, a younger crowd. When we get to the age that we are now, we sort of you know, look to, what if something happens, I need a will, and so we're a little bit more cognizant of, of wills and will planning. However, 25% um, of us who do have a will don't realize that our will is not valid anymore. That was a number that was shocking to me. Um, there's been changes in legislature, changes in, in all kinds of things that could make your will invalid. And John's going to talk about that. Um, also, we'd like to introduce our wonderful service providers. We have a few of them here today. Uh, Laura Price, a senior travel advisor and cruise specialist with Car Carson Carlson Waggedly Travels at the back. Leanne Morrison from Clear My Clutter. Uh, Gerard Buckley, again, our mortgage agent and uh, mortgage wellness expert. Barb Jeffrey, president of the Collingwood Garden Club. And Carol Reflinghaus, <laughs> good German name. Uh, Carol, uh, on my list, senior assist. They'll be glad to talk to you uh, at the end of the seminar about their own expertise when it comes to travel, decluttering, mortgages, gardening, and senior assist options. So I just want to take a moment to talk about uh, pivotal aging and transition. And that's the brochure that you have in your, in your little goodie bag. Um, transition is not necessarily a physical move from point A to point B. It does mean you have to sell your, it doesn't mean, it does not mean you have to sell your home and move to a retirement home. Uh, how many people really want to move uh, to a retirement home in the first place? I think it's more of a necessity than a want. Um, what does transition look like? Well, there's all kinds of different transitions. There's healthcare transition, there's financial transition, um, there's passing of a partner transition. Anything that transitions your life from where you are now to something else, good or bad. And, and that's what pivotal transition, that's what the program was built to assist people like us you with. It's my life is changing, I'm going from point A to point B, how do I get there and who can I turn to for help? So we as a real estate company want to be the advisors, if you will, to, to help you uh, with those changes. Sometimes it will affect real estate and sometimes it doesn't. I'm actually going to be taking a course uh, called uh, Certified Aging in Place. So it's not about selling your house, it's about helping you to make the changes in your house so that you can stay there for another 10 or 15 years longer. Now, sometimes it will involve uh, changing um, housing, and we're going to make sure that we help you move from that two-story house, maybe, with the stairs that you can't navigate anymore to a bungalow where you can stay for an extra 10 or 15 years. So, in some cases, we're going to help you move. In some cases, we're going to help you stay in place. It's become my life's purpose to give something back after 35 years of listing and selling people's properties and homes. So this is how I want to give, give back, and this is the program that I've created and the reason we're all here today. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to introduce John Ferris. John is a graduate of the University of Guelph and University of Windsor School of Law. John Ferris was called to the bar in 1975. His practice is one of a very general nature in the areas of real estate, mortgages, family law, wills, estates, corporations, municipal and land use, construction liens, and civil litigation. His firm has offices in Cremor, Dundalk, and Flesherton. In 2002, he obtained a certificate of dispute resolution from York University, and in 2004, a Master of Laws also from York University. 
He is a, a collaborative family lawyer, qualified mediator and arbitrator, and an active member of the collaborative family law group of Great Bruce and collaborative practice Simcoe County. So, whereas most lawyers want to fight and, and drag a case out, John is one of the only lawyers I know who's looking to resolve disputes and, and get on with people's lives. He facilitates alternative dispute resolution workshops and seminars and has presented these workshops in Ethiopia, India, Thailand, Nigeria, and Kenya, and of course in Canada. John is a chartered mediator with the ADR Institute of Canada. In 2018, he completed the Osgood Law School Certificate Program in Elder Law and is now a resource person with great life seminars and services in the areas of estate planning, wills, and power of attorney. He grew up on a family farm near Feversham. He now lives in Cremor. John is married with two children and has three grandchildren. And so without further ado, I want to bring up my friend and colleague, John Ferris. executor's checklist. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about what, what executors do. Uh, and the other is uh, Will's, we call it a Will's intake information form. So uh, I think there's enough to go around, but if you're if you're a couple, uh, the forms are kind of designed for one per couple. Uh, so if you would, if you're a couple, just take one for now and, and whatever's left will be at the back if you want to get a, another one uh, at the end. While those are being distributed, I'll tell you about the couple that went to the lawyer to have their wills prepared and on the way home they got into quite a serious discussion about what would happen if something happened to one of them and the decisions that would have to be made and what life would be like. And the husband said to his wife, well, you know, if I go first, I want you to be happy. And if that includes entering into another relationship and getting married, that's what I want you to do. I don't want you to feel guilty or that you're letting me down. Uh, what's your happiness is important to me. I don't care if you and your new husband live in our house, if he drives my truck, uses the garden tools. I do have one request, and he said it's kind of quirky, but it's important to me. And he said, I don't want your new husband using my golf clubs. They're very important to me, they're one of my most prized possessions, and I just don't feel right about another man using my golf clubs. And the wife said, uh, you don't need to worry, he's left-handed. <laughs> so, uh, we are going to be covering quite a bit of material today. Um, I think it's relevant. Um, I'm maybe going into it in a little more detail than uh, sometimes it's done in this kind of presentation. Uh, and there will be time uh, for questions at the end. So, we're going to talk about preparing your will and what's involved in doing that, and that's where the uh, will intake form uh, comes in. Uh, if you go to your lawyer to make a will, basically everything that, every question you're going to be asked is uh, on that form. It has to do with your family structure, whether you have previous wills, um, whether it's a second marriage for one or both of you, what family you have, and so on. So uh, required information is all potential beneficiaries. So that's everybody that you would be likely to or might wish to benefit from your will. Uh, the names and, address and contact information of professional advisors. It's not unusual uh, that your lawyer and accountant will consult with each other. Uh, I, I find that more and more in drafting people's wills, I'll say, yes, that, that's fine from a legal perspective, but you really need to talk to your accountant before, before we put that in writing. Uh, are there any existing wills? Uh, making a new will revokes the old one. Uh, it's a, a, if, if you've changed lawyers or moved to a new community, it's a good idea to get your hands on the old will and have it destroyed 
So there's no question about what is your, in fact, your last will. But when you make the new will, it cancels all previous wills. Uh, as people are living longer, uh, there are more and more second marriage situations, and there's a, 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 a whole other dimension of considerations in drafting a will. Uh, if, if, it's a, if, if it's a second marriage situation, one partner has family and the other does not, or they each have their own families, uh, if there's more thought involved and more drafting involved, usually in that kind of situation. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about joint ownership with that. And one of the questions that's very important is uh, most couples tend to have all of their assets registered jointly in both names and have each other as designated beneficiaries on their assets. Um, so you'll be asked about that uh, and perhaps even more in, uh, caution, uh, are there any joint accounts with any other person other than a spouse, specifically a, 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 an adult child? Uh, are you the executor or power of attorney for another person? Interestingly, if you are a, acting as an executor for someone's estate and you die, uh, under the Trustee Act, your executor takes over as executor for, not just for your estate, but for the estate that you're the executor of. That is not true of a power of attorney. If you're acting as a power of attorney and you're the sole attorney and you die, there is no power of attorney but it's called devolution of executorship. So if you are acting as an executor for any other person uh, and something happens to you, your executor steps into your shoes and acts as executor of that estate as well. So an executor's checklist is helpful and I'm not going to take time to go through the checklist. It is there uh, and it lists in, uh, I think in appropriate detail, uh, briefly, all of the all of the things, and, and an executor will not have to do all of those in every case, but uh, those are the things that you may be uh, involved in initially. The very first, I think it's the very first one there. Uh, many people don't realize that one of the responsibilities of the executor is to arrange and pay for the funeral. Uh, usually, that's done by the family. Very often, it's the same people. Uh, but if there's a question or if there's a dispute, as can happen uh, with, uh, sometimes there's a dispute between a new spouse and the adult family about the funeral arrangements and, and, and the, if the question is asked, well, who decides? The answer is, who's the executor? Uh, that's the very first thing that arises in an executor's responsibilities. We have plenty of time allocated for questions, and if you if you would just jot uh, and and uh, jot it down. Okay. Uh, well, I'll take one question. Okay. Okay. No, you don't. Need <laughs> well, if you write, I, if you write it down, I'd be happy to answer it. Again. So, who can make a will? Well. Basically, any person who's over 18 years of age who has legal capacity can make a will. So what does that mean? Well, uh, legal capacity is the, uh, the ability, the, the understanding required to make a will. In other words, you have, you have your, the mental faculties required to, to make a will. That is a legal decision, not a medical decision, although the person making the will may ask for a medical opinion, but whether a person has the legal capacity is a legal decision. So what does that involve? Well, this is the test that's involved. And when I was preparing this slide, I thought this is getting into fairly detailed and fairly deep um, material um, for uh, this kind of seminar, but at the same time, we did advertise it as an in-depth look at, uh, at wills and estates, or wills and, and probate. So, when you meet with a lawyer uh, to have your will drafted, or if the question arises whether you have the, cap the capability or the capacity, then you, be, they, you won't be asked these questions specifically, but this is what the test is. Do you have the ability to understand the nature and effect of it. In other words, you know you're making a will. Uh, you have to have a, a general understanding of what the assets of your estate are, what you have to give away. Uh, I'm 
understand the nature and effect of what you're giving under the will. Uh, estates now, if there's property with real estate values, estates are large. There's, there's significant sums of money in the estate. And so a person, uh, some people don't in fact realize what the worth of their estate is uh, because they're not up to date on value. So, that's not really what I'm talking about here, but they do have to have a, an understanding of what property they own and what assets they have, what they're disposing of, and what they're giving away. In other words, if they give 10% of their estate to one beneficiary, they should have some understanding of what that does that mean. So is it, it, it $10,000 or is it $100,000? They have to remember the uh, persons that they might or should include in their will. And in some cases, they need to have an awareness or the ability to understand um, that if you make your will a certain way, there is a potential for that being challenged. So you have to have the ability to understand that. And so what I, the steps I just listed, that's the mental test for the ability to make a will. The, the capacity required for a will is not the same as the capacity for a power of attorney for property, and it's not the same as the uh, test required for a power of attorney for personal care. Test for mental ability to make a, person, a power of attorney for health care is the lowest of the three. So, why and who can a will be challenged? Why and how and who can challenge a will? So, the, the basis upon which a will may be challenged is that the testator, which is the person making the will, did not have the legal capacity at the time. So that's what I just talked about: is that they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't realize when they put that clause in their will, they didn't have the understanding what the implications of that are. Uh, if there's undue influence or duress. So that's when somebody is improperly influenced in the drafting of their will. So undue influence is if an elderly person lives with one child uh, or is taken to live with one child or that child is spending an inordinate amount of time with them and counseling them on how to draft their will or suggesting to them what they might put in their will that's undue influence. Duress is something stronger than that, right? The, the duress would be, uh, if you don't include me in your will, you'll never see your grandchildren again. So, it's in, in either case, it's, it's improperly influencing or bringing something forward that causes someone to make a will in a manner, or a clause in a will in a manner that they would not otherwise have done. So these are, these are the bases upon which a will can be uh, subject to, and probably those are the most common uh, allegations for challenging a will. Um, so generally speaking, if a person has legal capacity and they um, are not improperly influenced, and they know what they're doing, they can put whatever they want in their will. So if they have four children and for whatever reason given 100% of their estate to one of them, they can do that. Unless uh, one of the others is, has some dependency. So the basis upon which a will can be challenged is the capacity of the testator, did they do it willingly, or did they not provide for someone who had dependency. So a child, merely because they're a child has no claim. Uh, they only have a claim if there's some financial dependency, if they are disabled or, well, basically if they're disabled and for that reason are financially dependent upon the parent, uh, they need to be provided for. Or is there a spouse? A spouse obviously has to be provided for in the will. And so if there's a spouse or, a depend or other dependent uh, that is not provided in the will, even though the person had capacity, that's another basis for the will being challenged. So, first decision in drafting your will before you get to who you're going to leave things to is who do you want as your executor or executors? 
good idea to have more than one in case uh, one becomes ill or passes away or is for whatever reason unable to act. Uh, it's a good idea to have more than one. The second or third person can either be uh, working together, it can be A and B, or it can be A or B. So you can have an alternative so that if, if the first person you've chosen is unable or unwilling or can't act for whatever reason, you have a backup person. Or you can say and, which means they both act throughout. Uh, so you kind of look around the family and see who are likely to be uh, good candidates to be the executors, most often on a normal estate. Uh, it, is, it is a family member. Are there adult children that would be capable of doing it? How do the children get along with each other? Uh, could the two or three of them work together as executors? Or are there other family members? Sometimes if the, um, if the next generation is relatively young or if there is some concern about two of them working together, uh, uh, a testator will look for another family member, an uncle or an aunt or a brother or someone that could be the, sort of the third party, so you get three executors. Uh, sometimes it's a close friend. There are times where there's really nobody in the family because being an executor is a job. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's work to be done, there's items to be completed, uh, there's business to be done. So it needs to be somebody that is capable of selling property, liquidating bank accounts, cashing investments, finding investments, uh, and, and handling the estate. So it is, an, it is a job, an executor does get paid, uh, and so there are times that, and maybe the family's just scattered. They're all in other countries, or on a, one's on the East Coast and one's on the West Coast. So in those instances, if there's not another family member, there may be a close friend that will do that. Uh, sometimes there are professional executors. Um, I have been asked to act as an executor. My preference when that happens is to be a co-executor with a family member. Um, but there are times where, uh, where there's significant stocks and shares in an estate or a business that needs to be operated. And uh, so there will be um, professional uh, executors who do that sort of thing for, for a living uh, would, be, would be appointed. And I guess it's not on the slide. The other one is, and I, I, I guess it one of the heading of professional executors, uh, trust companies and banks uh, will provide that service uh, generally, and, and I, I do recommend that if there's an estate where there's a lot of the estate consists of a por portfolio of stocks and bonds. Um, usually I would only recommend it in that sort of instance, and generally speaking, I think that the, uh, the financial institutions, the trust arm of the financial institutions, are probably more inclined to be executors and designated as executors, and they are more desirous of being executors if it's a relatively large estate where that kind of expertise is required. But that is another option. So when do you make a will? Well, as, as Max sort of alluded uh, in the introduction, everyone should have a will. Um, it is true that with most couples having jointly owned property and everything uh, with a designated beneficiary, it is true that on the passing of a husband or wife, uh, or a spouse, there may not be a whole lot that needs to be administered through the will, but often there are things that you haven't thought of that have not been registered that way. Uh, it, may, there may, it may not be huge items, but it's just going to be simpler if there's a will spelling out where that goes. So I guess what I'm saying is everybody, everybody has an estate, everybody has one bank account or something or personal belongings. So everybody should have a, at least a simple will. Uh, you should, uh, I recommend that people look at their will annually. Um, when a young couple have, a young family, a husband and wife have two children and they make a will, the will they make then probably doesn't need to be changed for quite some time. They're, they tend to leave everything to each other. 
And if anything happens to both of us, our entire estate is held in trust for all of our children alive at that time. Uh, that's probably not going to change unless there's more children or unless something happens to one of the children. But there are stages in life where it's more critical to update your will. When there's changes in the families, family break, families break up, uh, other assets are acquired, family cottage may be purchased, family cottage may be sold, uh, the family home may be sold and, and, and uh, people are moving into other types of accommodation. So I recommend look at, at least having a look at it annually and see if it is still what we want. Uh, that was, uh, I think, one of the points that Mac alluded to in the statistics he had at the beginning, that people who made a will, and the, did you have will? Oh yes, I have one. When did you make it? Well, 15 years ago. And it may not be, the will you make today probably would not be the will you would make five years from now. It may not be huge changes, but, but the will. So in drafting your will, I always tell people, you don't know how long you're going to live, you don't know how long your family's going to live, you don't know what your estate's going to be. So you draft your will today based on something happening today. If something happened to you today, what would you feel right about in doing with your will? Who would look after things and how would you leave it? And you update it as need be. And again, to repeat, the will you make today would not be probably not quite the same as you would do three years, five years, or ten years from now. Um, it surprises me the number of people that do not know that marriage proposes a will. So um, unless the will says that I am making this will in contemplation of marriage, that's the legal phrase. So if John and Sally are getting married next month and they make a will this month saying I'm making this will in contemplation of marriage to Sally, and I intended to continue, then it is valid. But if it uh, is, if that clause is not in there, regardless of who you marry and regardless of what the will says, marriage revokes a will. So you you can make exactly the same will over again uh, after the marriage, but but uh, when you got married, it canceled the will you have. Just push the right button would help. So a little bit about executor's duties, uh, and it, this is on the checklist in more detail, but very briefly, uh, one of the first things is to secure and obtain the, obtain the value of a state asset. So if you have been appointed as executor and you make the, the, the first, well, the first thing is the funeral. The next thing is to, is to find out what the estate consists of. And so you have to have a list of every investment, every bank account, every piece of real estate. And it's more important now, in fact, it's more critical now to have good values. It used to be that um, you could just sort of rely on reasonable estimates of the values of property. But in 2014 or 15, I think, the, the law now is that you can apply for probate any time. And so when you apply for probate, you stipulate on the probate application form what the value of the estate is, what the, how much the real estate is worth, and how much the other property is worth, and you pay the probate fee calculated on that amount. Now, within 90 days of when you get the probate, so that this, this is where the greater liability for executors comes in, uh, within 90 days of when you get the probate, you have to file what is called an estate, um, estate information return. And so it's really like a, a brief tax return. Uh, it's five or six pages, and it has more detail than the probate application had of... So, so let's say you paid probate fees on $1.2 million. The estate information form says, how did you calculate? That the real you know the real estate was six hundred thousand dollars the GICs were four hundred thousand everything else was so you list every item and its value so if and this does happen if you know property may sell for a lot more than you thought or a lot less than you thought so if the actual value has turned out to be more than it was when you filed the estate information or when you filed the probate application you have to pay the extra fees. So it's like filing your income tax return and there's money owing to the government. It can work the other way too. If there was some error in calculating the assets or 
property didn't sell for as much as the estimate was. Uh, sometimes people have a list of guaranteed investment certificates and there's some duplication, so they found out that one was in there twice. So if there's, um, if the actual value after you get probate is less than what you paid probate fees for on, you apply for a recount. So uh, that's, that's, what, that's one more um, fairly onerous responsibility um, for an executor in, 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 in having good values of the, of, the, uh, of the assets and having the probate value appropriately determined. So you apply for probate if necessary, and I'm going to talk on one of the next slides about when it may or may not be necessary, but uh, if you need probate, uh, and more often than not you do, uh, that is really the first one of the first things you do because you need that to open your bank account, you need that to liquidate assets, you need that to uh, sell property. So you apply for probate if necessary uh, and file all tax returns. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on that today other than the estate information return that I just mentioned. Uh, really the only tax returns, there is no, there's no federal estate tax or succession duty. The only tax, really, is the uh, probate fees, called the estate administration tax, paid to the provincial ministry of finance, and whatever income tax there is at the date of death. Uh, so all capital gains, all income, all income is determined as of the date of death. So the major tax return is the year of death income tax return. Uh, so then, once you have probate and all tax has been paid, uh, the executors can transfer assets to the beneficiaries or liquidate. It depends on how the will's worded. Uh, they may transfer a piece of property, for example, directly to two children and they can do whatever they wish with it, or they may sell it and divide the proceeds. Uh, most of the time, the executives liquidate all of the assets and distribute the, the cash to the beneficiaries according to the will. Before the, dis before the distribution, all debts have to be paid. And so the executor has to account to the beneficiaries. So what that means is, so you get the you, first thing you do is get the probate, then you will open one estate bank account. Uh, it's simpler to have one account that every dollar goes through. So then when you get to this stage to accounting to the beneficiaries, you can say on the date of death, there was, the, there was zero in the bank account. Since the date of death, we put in the money from the house, we put in the Royal Bank GICs, we put in the CIBC uh, RRSPs, we've cashed the life insurance policies. Here's all those amounts. We paid all of these bills. This is what's left. and. We would like you to sign a release that you're satisfied, and then we will issue our checks to you. So that's what we mean by accounting to the beneficiaries. Two ways that can be done. Uh, you can have to, the way I just described, where you account to the beneficiaries and say, this is what the estate consisted of, this is everything we paid, this is what we have left to pay you, and please sign a release. If they don't or won't, then the court has to approve your accounts. So again, it's it's fairly onerous for the executor to keep very detailed and scrupulous accounts with every receipt and every invoice and every dollar that went into the account and everyone without. Uh, because if, if you do have to file the um, if you have to file your your accounts with the court, it's it's a, it's quite sophisticated accounting. At that stage, at that stage again, you will, unless you're an accountant yourself, you will, you will get professional help to complete those. And then ultimately, there's the final distribution of the assets. So in drafting the will, they they um, they tend to. A lot of what I'm talking about here applies to uh, couples, but I, don't, I guess. Uh, I guess all of those three would be would be two people involved. I mentioned earlier the young couple with the two children, and, and so when we talk about mirror wills, it's um, they reflect each other, so they're identical. So 
husband's will leaves everything to the wife and then to their children. Wife's will leaves everything to the husband and then to their children. So they're called mirror wills because they're identical. And if something happens to both of them, there's no conflict because if something happens to both of them, there's no joint tenancy. There's two estates, half his and half hers. And so because the two wills are identical, there's no conflict in doing that. Um, if, if, it's, uh, if, there, if, the husband, if the spouse's wills are not identical, then they're not mirror, mirror wills. And it depends on whether the property was jointly owned and if the property is jointly owned, it's revenue. You have to know who died first, because and then whoever died first, the assets would go to the survivor. Uh, so it becomes more complicated. Uh, more often, it would be a second marriage situation or uh, a marriage where one partner brought more assets into the estate or into the marriage than the other. One may have children and the other doesn't. So I mentioned earlier that you have to be in, bear in mind that if you have a spouse, you are, are likely, to, unless there's a marriage contract or they're independently wealthy, um, if you have a spouse, you're going to have to make some provision for them. It may not have to be 100%. But you may have to deal with who can they stay in the matrimonial home if it's registered in your name. There will have to be some provision, or will likely be some provision for the spouse and the balance to the children. Um, so that's that's kind of the second broad category, and there can be all sorts of variations within that. Uh, the 50% goes to the spouse, we'll say, and 50% of the children. Does that go immediately, or? Does the spouse get the interest from that as long as she lives and then it goes to the children? Um, and the third one is a spousal trust and that's where sometimes it's used as a tax planning uh, situation. That again is a case I'm not even going to try to explain it because uh, I don't understand it, but it would be in consultation with the, your accountant. There can be situations where it's financially advisable to basically skip person um, and they never inherit the entire estate so if all of the assets are in wife's name it will say that she's quite wealthy and there's not a lot of assets in the husband's name it may be advantageous to maintain her estate open for all of his life and he gets all of the income and it can be drafted and gets some of the capital as well and then it goes to somebody else so again, that's more likely to be the case on a relatively large estate and where the major portion of the estate assets are owned by one partner. So within those three benefit categories, so, so we're at the stage now where we've chosen our executors, we've thought about how we're going to deal with each other uh, as far as spouses are concerned, and then what happens. So uh, these are the questions I generally ask people when I'm getting instructions. Are there any specific cash requests? Is there anybody, before you divide the residue, is there a family member, a friend, um, a charity that you want to give some specific amount to? Uh, and so that, that, get, that gets paid. So the order of payment is debts are paid first and then specific bequests. So if, once we've got the list of the beneficiaries, there's two ways of doing it. You can say, um, I want $20,000 to go to each grandchildren, grandchild and the rest to go to my two children. So that's a specific bequest of $20,000 and the rest in residue. There's two children, they're each going to get 50%. So you can distribute the estate either by specific amounts or percentages. Uh, there will always be a residue. There's always something at the end uh, after you've done all of those specific amounts. Um, I, I usually recommend on the, on the charitable bequests, uh, I, if, the, if the bulk of the estate is going to family members, I tend to recommend making whatever charitable bequest, bequest you want 
as a specific sum rather than a percentage. There's nothing wrong with giving a charity uh, 5% or 10% or 50% of your estate, but if, if they're getting a minor share of the estate of the bulk of it's going to the family, I suggest rather than 10%, give them $100,000 if your estate's a million dollars. The reason for that is to go back to the accounting to beneficiaries. So when the executors are concluded in distributing the estate, if the Canadian Cancer Society is getting 10%, you have to account to them to show them how you calculated their 10%. And they, they look at them quite closely. Some charities look at them very closely and they question items that were paid and, and what they were. If the will says you get $100,000, you get $100,000 and, and there's no accounting involved. It's here's your check, sign and receipt. So it's nothing wrong with doing it by percentages, but I always make people aware of that uh, and say which way you want to do it. Um, any prior gifts to a beneficiary? I'm, I'm thinking there specifically about family members. Uh, sometimes people help uh, child, uh, uh, adult children buy their home or they're in some financial difficulty and you bail them out. And, uh, you, you know, the money you gave them at that time, was it a gift or was it a loan? Uh, if there's one family member that has received some funds already, is that just fine, or is that to be taken into account? Are, 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 if, if they've already gotten 50000 are the others to get 50000 now before the distribution? Maybe not, but it's a question to be asked. If there's a, uh, any gift to uh, a minor, anyone under 18, whether it's a specific amount or a percentage, will have to be in, held in trust until age 18. The trustees can be the executors, or you can say the parents of those children are, are to be the trustees. But in any event, it has to be held in trust until age 18. Often people say um, 18 is not old enough. They may say uh, be held in trust till age 21 or given to them in stages. Uh, you may have heard the phrase handsome trust. So if there is a person with a, a, a disabled beneficiary. What an handsome trust is, is uh, it's a trust for that beneficiary. So they get their share of the estate, but it's always held in trust. So the trustees can use that money for things that aren't necessities of life to make their life more comfortable. Um, you know, vacations, uh, uh, better television, uh, rent a better accommodation. Uh, whatever, things that are a benefit to that person uh, and, and the, the, executive, the trustees have a fairly broad discretion in that regard, but the, the, uh, the funds, the, 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 the share for that beneficiary never transfers to the beneficiary. So uh, it's a specific wording. Uh, it was uh, it, because of the Hanson family, the ministry of, at that time, I think, uh, Consumer and Commercial Relations challenged a bequest to the Henson, was a Henson child and said, uh, we're going to cut off your OBSP because there's a, there's a fund of money here for you and all you have to do is ask for it. And so until that's used up, you don't get your OBSP. The Henson family, and, and it was worded this way, this, this kind of trust was in the will. And so the Henson family successfully took that to court and the court ruled, no, the way this is worded, they, they, it's always in trust till the time the child dies and so you must continue the, you must continue the ODSP pension. So if there's a disabled person in the family, you will hear mention of a handsome trust or it's more properly called a, a trust for a disabled beneficiary. But, uh, so that's where it came from. And so to do that, you have to name a trustee who's going to administer the funds. It can be one or more. It can be the executors or somebody else. The wording about their discretion is prescribed. That's always the same. But then there has to be um, a statement of where, to, whatever money's left, where does it go? Does it go to the other family members, or does it go to charity? Or those are the requirements. There have to be trustees. There has to be the specific wording, and there has to be where does the residue go? Uh, 
Um, so a spendthrift beneficiary is somebody that they're not disabled, but they can't handle money, right? And, and it may be because they have some substance abuse problems. It may be just because they haven't got the ability to handle money. And if they get, you know, if they get $250,000 today, it'll be gone in six months. So you can either do the same sort of thing as the Hanson Trust. You can have another family member or somebody ask as trustees and dole it out to them through time, uh, uh, specifying the time. Um, or the other way of doing it that is um, sort of trouble-free is to um, invest, to instruct, the benefit, to, to instruct your executors that the third of my estate that goes to my son John is to be used to purchase an annuity for John payable for the rest of his lifetime. So he will get a check every month for the rest of his life. It's the same as any other annuity, uh, but he'll never get the lump sum. So it's like it's like a it is an annuity. It's like a little pension for him. Uh, so that's those are the two ways of dealing with. Well, there may be more, but those are two ways of dealing with it. Um, and the uh, I know of instances where the um, um, annuity has worked quite well. And I've talked about the specific amount of percentage for charities. So I've talked quite a bit about probate. Um, probate is a court process, uh, so you don't have to go to court, but there's forms you have to fill in applying for probate. Uh, and, and so basically it's a court order approving the will. It says, yes, this is a good and valid will. It's properly signed, properly executed, um, and the executors named in the will have the authority to act. Um, different financial institutions have different rules. Generally, if there's more than $50,000 in the estate, you will have to get probate. And for sure, if there's real estate, uh, and if there's Canada savings bonds and some investments such as that, you will have to get probate. There are assets that may be transferred without probate, such as items of personal property, like if you have expensive works of art or vintage automobiles or valuable items like that, they can be transferred without probate. Uh, or shares, the, one of the most relevant ones is shares in private corporations. So if you have a um, family business corporation and mom and dad each own 50 shares, those can be, and, that's, and, and maybe the business is worth $10 million, it doesn't matter, you don't need to probate to transfer those shares. So that brings us to what's a primary will and a secondary will. So the primary will is basically the will. The primary will is the will we always do for everybody. It deals with all of your estate uh, that must be included in the probate. So, um, and I've mentioned the things that must be included, like the, the, the accounts over $50,000 in real estate and so on. That'll all be dealt with by the primary will. If there are items that qualify to be administered without probate, you would do a secondary will. So the reason people try to avoid, avoid probate is the fees involved. Um, and the, the provincial government's now being more honest and they're calling it an estate administration tax rather than probate fees because it really is a tax based on the value of the estate. It's not horrendous, but it is significant. So on small estates under $50,000, it's $5 a thousand. So on a $50,000 estate, it's $250. Uh, and then over $50,000, so every $1,000 over $50,000, it's 1.5% uh, or $15. So on a $300,000 estate, it's roughly $4,500. And it's paid to the Minister of Finance at the time you make the probate application. And I've talked about the fact that then after you get the probate, you have to justify how you calculated that. So if you have, and, and the most common instance is shares in a private corporation. Uh, I mean, there's no harm in doing a secondary will, even if you don't have that, for the personal items that I mentioned. 
but the secondary will is for everything for which probate is not required. And the will says that. It says specifically that this will is limited to the assets that my executors determine <coughs> can be administered without probate. So anyway, just to carry on then, so the, the secondary will, um, if I go over there, can I, is, is the screen visible there? Okay. 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 <laughs> Anybody got a question right now? <laughs> Touch of the master's hand. Um, <laughs> so I was going to say, so let's say you had $100,000 in a joint account, yeah. and your husband passes away, then that money becomes yours. Yes. Correct. So if you do the two wills, they may be identical. In fact, I'm finding that is more often than not that is the case. There are situations where it's not. Um, in some instances, for example, if the major asset of the corporation is a farming operation and the son is going to carry on the farming operation, the secondary will may benefit him in, alone in that regard and the primary will will, to the extent it's possible, equalize things with other assets. So they may be the same or they may be different. It is critical that both wills be signed at the same time, together, contemporaneously, and each will refers to the other. And the reason for that, if you go back to the very beginning, I said that uh, when you make a new will, it re revokes the old one. So if it's not properly worded, and you make your primary will, and then you sign your secondary will, uh, the secondary will would revoke the primary one that you signed five minutes ago because it's the most recent will. So there's a paragraph that has to go in each will saying that at the moment, at, at, uh, on the day that I sign this will, I am signing the primary or secondary will, as, as the case may be, uh, and it is not my intention that, um, that signing this will revokes the other. So, and, and the question he was asked here, uh, so, and, and, and this is on the uh, um, will planning information form. Uh, any assets that are registered in joint ownership or that have, have designated beneficiary pass automatically um, on death. Um, until about 2006, it was quite clear that regardless of who the account was joint, jointly owned with, and regardless of what the will says, uh, if you had a joint account with one of your three children uh, and you died, that account went to the child in the story. Uh, there have been some cases where that has been challenged and uh, uh, allegations that the reason that account was in a joint account with my brother was for convenience, so that he could pay bills, so he could access the account, so he could uh, make investments out of the account for, for the, the parent. And so now the question is, there is a question of intention, and in opening the joint account, did the testator intend, in fact, that that account would pass to that child, or was it done as a matter of convenience, or, or to avoid probate fees? And so, uh, it's important now, uh, and we put a clause in every will we draft, saying one of two things, that any bank account I have registered jointly with another person, I intend to go to that person, or any bank account I have registered jointly with any of my children is for a matter of convenience, and I still expect that to be part of my estate. Because those cases I mentioned said that the court will have to will require evidence as to what your intention was. Or, uh, so, so did the did the testator continue to use the account as though it was solely their name on it? Did they declare all of the interest on their tax return? Did they consult with the bank and within the absence of the other person? So, if there's evidence that they continued to use the account as their own, it was it, it 
falls back into the estate. So it's important now the, the, the joint account is still valid. It will still go to that person uh, and there, it will go without probate. But the recipient may be required to bring it back into the estate. So it's, it's useful, uh, important for in, in the will to say how are those joint accounts to be dealt with. So the reason people put property, and I, I guess I'm thinking here specifically about real estate, uh, but it applies to a certain extent to other investments as well. The reason people put it in joint owners with joint ownership with a child or children is to avoid the probate fees, which I described to you. It's one at 1.5 percent. So on a $500,000 piece of property, the probate fees would be $7,500. If you put it in joint ownership with your children and you die, they will, there will not be the probate fees. That is true. The disadvantage that can arise is that if that's the house you live in, it's your prime principal residence and there is no capital gains tax for you. It is not the principal residence of your children. So they do not claim that exemption and their cost of acquisition is zero. So they can find themselves in a situation where, because the cost of acquisition is zero, the capital gains is all is five hundred thousand dollars. So if that is triggered, it's significantly more than the probate fees. Uh, another consideration is sometimes marriages fail. So if you have uh, your your house or family cottage or what have you in joint ownership with uh, family members and marriage fails, there may be a question about whether that is part of their net family property. Uh, sometimes you will get into a financial difficulty, so if another family member is a joint owner of the property uh, and they run into difficulty with creditors, the property may be in jeopardy there as well. So just a couple of things that I made note of. Um, we do have time for questions. Uh, a couple of things that came up uh, earlier that I don't have on a slide. Everything I've talked about here is what I would call a traditional will. It's, uh, it doesn't have to be drafted by a lawyer, but usually it is. So it's prepared uh, for you, typed up, uh, signed by you and two witnesses who are present at the same time. Uh, in Ontario, uh, Holograph wills are valid. Holograph means handwritten. Uh, so a handwritten will is valid, uh, can be admitted to probate. Uh, the only requirements are that it has the only, only three requirements. It has to be uh, dated entirely in your handwriting and signed with your signature. So that's a, that's a holograph will. So. Uh, I guess the, the reason we, we encourage people to, to, to not do a holograph will is because of some of the things that I've been mentioning. Uh, but a holograph will is, is a perfectly valid will. There are also um, will kits and stationaries, stationers forms. Uh, I have seen problems with the stationers forms because the requirement for a holograph will is that it has to be entirely in your handwriting. The stationer's form is not. It's partially printed and partially in your handwriting. In other words, you fill in the blanks. So if you're going to use that kind of form, then, it, then it's not really a holograph will. It must be you and the witnesses have to initial every page. The witnesses have to both sign it at the same time. So, uh, so either either do a either do a formal will or a holograph will, or if you're going to use the form, do it as though you were doing a formal will. There were a couple of questions over here. Yes. Question is, if you in, in the house you live in is your primary residence, will your child have to be paid taxes? No, because it's your primary residence. What I was saying is, if you put their name on it now, 
to avoid the probate fees. So you make them a joint owner, and then 20 years from now you die, they're going to pay capital gains tax on 100% of the value because their cost of acquisition is zero. And it's not their current primary residence. So, so, so if I don't do that, then they do have to pay They will have to pay probate fees. They will not pay capital gains. So if, you're, I don't, if, if your house is worth a million dollars, they're going to pay $15,000 in probate fees. If they're a joint owner and the house is worth a million dollars, there's a $500,000 capital gain, which is taxable. So what I'm saying is the by putting it in joint ownership, you will save probate fees, but the cost may be much, much higher. If, if you get caught with capital gains, it will be higher. The lady beside you and then the gentleman. Well, it's, if, if their principal residence too, why do they have to pay capital gains? question is if it's, if it's principal residence, why would it? Because it, it, if they live with you, they will not, because it's their principal residence too. But if they have another house, and you put their name on your deed to avoid probate, then it's they can't have two principal residences, so their other one is their real principal residence. So this one is the same as a rental property or secondary property, it's taxable. If that house uh, passes to a child who does not presently own a house, and that child moves in, that would become the principal residence. Will there be capital gain in that, in that sense? <laughs> The, um, the, the the strict legal answer is yes because it um, it um, the capital gains tax it only become the capital gains tax is triggered before it becomes their principal residence so there's a change in use there it becomes their from the point it becomes their principal residence there's no tax but from the day they move in up to the day they move in. There would be. But if they if they if they inherit it from your will, there's not there's probate fees. Okay, so if it's inherited from the will, there's no um, there's no probate on it. There is probate. There's probate, not capital there's gains. No capital gains. Yeah. It's in the That's right. Does they, that apply to property joint owner property? No. If it's joint, they own. There's no probate fees. But it does apply. It does apply to jointly owned property. So if you, yes. So if you add a son or daughter to your house to avoid probate fees, and you do that now, you will avoid probate fees. The danger is you may trigger capital gains tax after death. We're talking about land. Yeah. It's not a home. It's land. There's pro. There's capital gains on the land. Joint. Joint owner. Um. Yeah, if the land is joint, there will be, uh, I think what would happen there is if, if, it's, if it's land without a residence, um, it will pass to the other person without probate. They will inherit your capital gains position. In other words, it rolls over. So. If, if, if the, uh, when they sell it 20 years from now, the capital gains tax will not just go back to when you die, but it will go back to the nature of the property. It's called a roll. So it's better just to leave it in the estate? Yes. Yes? So for a hologram will? Hologram, yeah. Do you have to have a witness? No. A hologram will, if it's, it has to be dated, Totally in your handwriting and signed by you. And then, if you were um, doing the will kit and you were going to have witnesses, how many witnesses? Two. And who should not be a witness? Uh, your spouse or anyone that's named it in the will, uh, or, or the spouse of anyone named in the will. Yes. Or is the CRA computer link yet to probate offices? Uh, 
I don't, I'm not aware that CRA is. Uh, Minister of Finance certainly is. For yeah, yeah, and that's, that's the uh, estate information return I mentioned. So, back here. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so if, if you have mirror wills and both, both people die, then what happens? Uh, then there's two estates. So that because each, each, each leaves the other, and so the mirror will says that my spouse does not survive, everything goes to my children. So there's no joint tendency, it doesn't move each other, there's, there's two estates. Okay, what if you don't have children? Then it goes to whoever your will says. So if, if mirror wills would say, if, if, if I die, everything goes to my spouse, if my spouse does not survive me, everything goes to whatever. Uh, nieces divided amongst my nieces and nephews and alive. Then and, and, and because they're mirror wills, they will both say the same thing. So it would then go to those nieces and nephews. But uh, at that stage, although they're mirror wills, uh, the beneficiaries would not have to be the same because there's two estates. There's no joint ownership. Uh, there's, there's your estate and your spouse's estate. So your will would leave your estate to your nieces and nephews, and your spouse's will could leave his or her estate to their beneficiaries. Okay, but if there's one joint beneficiary, then you have to have two joint beneficiaries. Yeah. Yeah. So there's then the, the joint ownership is split. So do, do, do people have jointly owned property and they both die at the same time? Um, the joint ownership is split. There's two estates. No. No, the question was if there's a pension and the children are beneficiaries, does that have to be probated? No, they're designated beneficiaries. Um, if there's a premature agreement, there's no will yet, there's a premature agreement staying in place, was the married but the will Yes, yeah, prenuptial agreement would stay in place until until the will is signed. Um, usually the prenuptial agreement will say in the event of a conflict between this agreement and my will, uh, the will will prevail. So, or, or, or other wording would be that although you have a prenuptial agreement releasing any interest in each other's estate, the agreement will say accept what I give my partner in my will, right? So if you have a prenuptial agreement and then you give $100,000 to your spouse um, in your will, the will would prevail. Yes? So my other question is from your executive checklist about the advisor beneficiaries about uh, claiming the income. So is that anything that they inherit from you through the will? Read the, read the line. <laughs> Advise beneficiaries regarding the inclusion of income from the estate in their income tax form. Oh, yeah. So when you, um, so the 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 estate, uh, the one the first tax return will have, will have been filed for the deceased person up to the date of death. So usually the estate is administered within a year. So the interest. Uh, let's say the person died in January of this year and the estate's getting distributed in December. You can do an estate tax return for the interest for this year. The simpler way of doing it is that. So whatever interest has accrued uh, in the estate from date of death, February till December when you're distributing the estate, the interest is taken by the uh, taken on the tax return of the beneficiary. Right. You follow me? So rather than the estate filing another tax return, you just divide the interest uh, to to amongst the beneficiaries. Back here, and then yeah. The executor is entitled to a maximum five percent. Is that a taxable benefit? Yes. Executor's maximum compensation is 5%. If there's two of them, it's divided, and it is income to them. Um, being an executor and uh, a quite a large estate, 
and the person had uh, some very large outstanding bills to pay, can you pay that before you actually apply for the um, Can you repeat, John? Sorry? Yeah, the question is if, if, a, if a deceased person had bills outstanding at the date of death, could they pay, be paid by probate or before you get probate? Yes. Uh, most, most financial institutions, if you have the invoice and the death certificate and a copy of the will saying you're the executor, uh, they will issue a bank draft directly to the creditor. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, sorry. The the question is, what's the timeline for getting probate? Um, it varies a little bit by what county you're in, uh, but generally speaking, in Simcoe and Gray, that I'm familiar with, it's um, more than a month and less than two months from the time you apply. Now. The will, the court will, if you apply for probate um, and you have real estate you're dealing with and you sell it, if and you're in that two month waiting period, if you take a copy of the signed agreement of purchase and sale to the court and say we have sold the house, it's closing May the 10th, they will expedite it for you. But generally it's a couple of months. So you're saying a house can go for sale before the probate yes. process? Yeah. Okay. You can't complete it without probate, but but you but you can submit your house. So I tell people, you know, don't list the house till we've applied for probate at least. Uh, but then, you know, you if you list the house, unless you list it with Max, it's going to take thirty days to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's going to take some time for the deal to close. But if you have, if you've submitted your application and you're waiting that six weeks or two months to get your probate, and you and your real estate deal is closing sooner than that, you can expedite it. Yes, sir. Hi, John. If Bill and Mary have mere wills, right? Bill passes away. Mary's not bound by that will if she wishes to renew a will. Very good point. The question is, if there's mirror wills and one of the two people passes away, is the other bound by the will? Um, the simple answer is no. There has been there have been some cases litigated, I don't think with great success, where they've alleged that at the time they made the will there was some kind of a trust created uh, on Mary's part and that she can't vary that by making a new will, but. The simple answer is yes. Thank you. So I'll speak up because we don't have a second microphone. I apologize. Um, this is about executors. If if um, if a testor uh, uh, chooses an executor, how does that executor get notified that they are now an executor? Is it the, the lawyer that does it? Do they have to do it? Does it wait to wait until the time of death? Um, Question, I, I don't know, you probably heard Max's question. How does he, if you've been appointed as an executor, how do you know? There's not a really a very um, good way of doing that. Um, uh, I think people, well, in, in, the, in the smaller centers, the, the, the practice, the norm still is that most people leave their original will with their lawyer, and the reason for that is it's safekeeping, and if they want to make changes, they know where it is. It's also accessible if something does happen to them. Uh, so we always tell people, I, I don't encourage people to give the executor or family members copies of the will because you may change it and they will know what the will said before. Um, but, so, but I always tell people, you know, your, your family should know where the will is. So um, uh, it's, it's a good practice for the person making the will to make their family and or their executor aware of where the, where the will is. Second part of that question, so um, somebody chooses a son or daughter to be the executor, it's fine at the time, and five years later that executor says, I, I can't do this anymore, it's like it's too complicated for me, or I don't want to do it, or I'm moving away, then what happens? If the person designated, and this is another reason it's a good idea to have more than one, right? 
so if a, an executor has moved away or they're ill or they just per, have too much to do, is unable to act, they can renounce. They, they can sign, a, 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 it's called a renunciation, it's more saying I do not choose to be, I will not act as an executor. Quite excited to do that. If somebody else, if you have a secondary alternative, then they're it. Uh, they take over and do it. If you don't, then an executor has to be appointed by the court. So, so if there's if, if there's two executors, they both have died. Uh, someone, probably a family member, will have to apply. Uh, it's called a probate with a, a, a trusteeship with the will annex. So it means that the designated trustee is not doing it, but there is a trustee appointed by the court, and it's still the will is still valid. Third part of the question. I'm sorry. I'm How many parts are there? No, just this last part. Okay. So, because executors are really important to me. So, sounds like being an executor can be complicated. Um, we're going to do a whole uh, seminar just on executors and, and how it works and the liabilities and, the, and what can go wrong. And there are things that can go wrong. As, as families are more and more complicated now, we're, we're finding that uh, someone can challenge you know, the executor or sue the executor. Can you, I already know the answer to the question, but I want everybody else to hear, can you get executor insurance and what is the likelihood of being sued if you were an executor and somebody else challenged you? Um, I have no experience with the executor's insurance, but I know it exists. I believe it does. Um, and my experience has been, and it, it, it has, it's not a huge experience either, but my experience has been not that the executors have been sued personally, it's more likely that there's a uh, claim to have them removed as executors, uh, and, and, they, and, and, they, and their fees will be taken away from them. Uh, I mean, it is quite, it, uh, an executor is a trustee, so there's a, fair, a very high duty to act in good faith. So it is quite possible for an executor to be sued for um, improvidently selling property, not getting, not getting the best value for the property that was sold, or not getting the estate administered within a reasonable time so there's additional costs, or not liquidating the assets if there's shares, not liquidating the assets promptly and prudently so they've gone down in value. It's certainly quite possible, and there are cases where executors are sued personally. It is more common that there's a claim to remove. Uh, does that answer you? Yeah. yeah. Am I right? There is an executor. Um, there, there is insurance, and, yeah. and people should look into it because you can, you can get sued by um, uh, spouses, uh, children twice removed, and families are more and more complicated. Let's face it. So. Everybody feels that they didn't get enough, and, and so they start challenging the executors. So I know that there's uh, executor insurance. If you appoint a family member, a loved one, to be an executor, you should look into executor insurance. I didn't know that it existed until just a little while ago. There's a case where, I'll just quickly yeah. say, this is a case where this couple, brother and sister, they didn't get along. They were living in different parts of the country. Um, mom dies, leaves the house. And uh, by the time the one executor daughter came in from Vancouver, it was two months, it was November, December, the pipes froze, damage to the house. They decided, you know, come spring, they weren't going to fix the house up, they were just going to sell it as is. So they sold it, it's a $600,000 house, they sold it for $400,000. They said, just take it as is, we don't feel like fixing it up because we're not getting along and I don't want to take responsibility, neither does my brother. CRA comes along two years later and sues them, sues them, and wins because they had a responsibility to look after the house at the time of death and get an appraisal. They said, well, the house is only worth $400,000. It sat on the market for three months. Nobody wanted it. CRA said, yeah, but the house was worth $600,000 on the day of death because it was in good shape. You let it get water damaged, fall apart, Yes, it became worth $400,000, but we want our full appraised value. So executors are responsible for getting an appraisal on the date of death and another appraisal on the date of sale and then being responsible to CRA for the rest of the yeah. estate for 
you know, what went wrong here? Why did, why did we only get $400,000 for a $600,000 house? So that was an eye-opener for me. Yeah. And as I say, we'll be having a lot more uh, discussions in further seminars about executors' responsibilities. We're all going to choose in this room an executor to look after our state, big or small. It could be a, a son, a daughter, a family member, a relative, could be a lawyer, could be a bank, could be me. I don't know. Um, but uh, it's an important, it's an important yeah. subject. So check yeah. into executor insurance. Yeah, that's 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 that's, that's very. No, the next seminar will be on this real estate, and then we'll we'll uh, I think there's a we'll be doing a survey to ask what everybody's interested in, and we'll sort of do it by popularity. But uh, this seems to be a popular. And just thing. while everyone is still here, um, you, our uh, our firm name and contact information is on the on the uh, notepads. There are business cards at the back. Uh, my email address is not on there, but your the phone numbers are. Um, and my partner and I will be making ourselves available for, for appointments in Collingwood at uh, Engel and Volker's office. We would need a little bit of lead time to arrange an appointment in the morning or afternoon. Um, and so you can call the Cremore office and say, when can I see one of the lawyers in Collingwood? And we'll set that up for you, either to just review your will, see if it needs to be updated, or if there are changes that you want to be made, uh, or, or just to answer any questions you may have, uh, we're happy, um, happy to do that. Yes? Um, BC passed a law that you cannot write your, any child out of your will. Is there any indication of that coming to Ontario, and what's the best way to protect us? Should we still say we're leaving $100 to this one child? Not I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the BC legislation. Um, I, I, I mean, it depends on the wording of the legislation. Uh, I mean, if it says you have to name them. Uh, I mean, child, really? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's certainly at the moment uh, nothing like that in Ontario. But how do we protect ourselves if one child is sort of abandoned the family? Is it better to say I'm moving that child? So I well, it would depend on what the legislation says. Uh, I, mean, it, uh, it, I mean, I have had people where they're adamant, and there's a, we have a we have a set clause that we can put in for people, and it says I have not made a provision for my son John in this will. That is not an oversight. So they mentioned them and said, you know, this, I mean this right. So uh, it would depend on the wording of legislation because I mean, if, if the if the legislation says you have to name somebody. Then you could say, okay, I'll name them. Here's a dollar, right? Uh, but it says they have to have a certain percentage. Uh, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. At the very back. Um, this is advisable to choose an executor who is aware of the law and can help you with the Thank you. The question is, is it advisable to choose an executor as a resident of Canada? Absolutely. Because if you don't, um, if you have an executor who, is, who lives in, in the United States or anywhere else in the world, um, Revenue Canada considers the estate a non-resident. And so there's a whole other dimension to the tax returns and the complexity of it. Uh, e even though all of the assets are here and all the beneficiaries may be here, uh, if you have a non-resident executor, uh, it's considered a non-resident estate for tax purposes. Thank you for that. And gentlemen. I believe you said that when you make an application for probate, the probate fee is payable at that time? Probate, if, if the probate fee is payable at the time you submit the application. In that case, if the estate is basically investments in real property, where does the money come from? Uh, if, well, uh, my my experience. So, it, it, when you apply for probate, you have to pay the uh, probate fees at that time. And the question is, if there are no liquid uh, funds, how how is that been handled? If there's real estate, it's a problem. But if the uh, estate is in investments, it takes longer. But my experience has been that whatever financial institution has those investments will cash or liquidate enough to pay the probate fees. 
So you do a, you take, you, the executors take a letter of direction and a copy of the will and a copy of the death certificate, same as any other bill, and say we need a check for $12,000 to the Minister of Finance, and, and, and they will do that. Uh, any other, yes? Yes. Question, question is, can you leave a future grandchild in your will? And the answer is yes. Uh, you would um, probably do the specific amount that I mentioned uh, to be held in trust for whatever is whatever is the uppermost limit of time that you would anticipate a grandchild being born. Uh, Twenty years, we'll say. Uh, $100,000 to be held, held on by trustees for a period of 20 years and divided amongst any grandchildren who are born during that time. Yes? One other thing, I don't have any foreign property, but I understand that if you have foreign property like in Florida, you should have a separate U.S. will for foreign property. Uh, the question is if people have property in Florida, should they have another will? property in that country um, yes it, it, it's not essential because if you if, if you make a will where your residence is in Canada it uh, covers your worldwide property however it will have to be reprobated in Florida so it's probably simpler to have a of bill drawn according to Florida legislation by a Florida attorney it would be like a secondary will dealing only with and it would have to be worded like a secondary will, so it doesn't revoke your Canadian. Yes? What is the cost of having a will drawn account? Cost of having a will done? Depends on how much drafting is involved. Um, in our, uh, I'm, uh, I'll leave it. I would say that in this area, um, <coughs> different law firms have different fee schedules. Um, but a husband or a couple's wills, usually a couple will do a, a will, two wills, two powers of attorney, two powers of attorney for health care would be less than $1,000. Okay. And in some cases, quite a bit less. Um, and if it's an individual, it's probably half that. Two quick ones. The first one is. If you don't have a will and you die, does the government get everything? No. If you die without a will, does the government get anything, everything? No. If you die without a will, it will go to whoever your next closest kin are. Second question is, do you have to let the people in the will know that they're in the will? You have to let the people in the will know that they're in the will? No. And in fact, I generally wouldn't because you may change it. Right. They should know where the will is. Okay, they should know that if something happens to me in my wills in my locked desk drawer or it's my lawyer's office or what have you, they should know you have a will, they should know where it is, but I would not tell them what's in it. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, as John mentioned, we will be holding some workshops at the Angle of the Office in the boardroom. Um, John, is there, any, is there any cost for people to bring their will in or some questions in for review? No, I should have mentioned that. No okay, so there's no cost for that. It'll be a review. Um, if, if you want to have a new will drawn up or major changes to a will, then that's a different story. But the review and answering questions and sort of having a consultation with John and his law partner will be free. We'll be letting everybody know uh, by email or phone uh, or letter when and again it's where is the Angle Volker's office at 15 here on Ontario Street. Um, so thank you John, that was very informative. And uh, but, it, but it is only by appointment? Yes, yeah, it's by appointment. So we don't have everybody showing up at the same time. I, I, we do have four prizes to give away. Um, uh, Two centerpieces, a bee and butterfly house provided by Collingwood Garden Club, and a, a chocolate basket provided by uh, Gerard Buckley. So if you can uh, grab, your, grab your tickets. Uh, first one.
one for the centerpiece, the yellow centerpiece uh, up the back here, 4890729. Anybody have that? There you go. Yellow centerpiece. Next one. Thank you all for coming to us. This was a fantastic turnout. We're very, very pleased. Um, 489, oh, this is for the uh, centerpiece purple. Uh, 4890683. 0683. Okay, purple. Next, uh, B in Butterfly House. Lucky number 4890678. 0678. <laughs> Who got that one? Zero six seven eight. Good. And the last one. Who likes chocolate? Courtesy of Gerard Buckley. Lucky number four eight nine zero six nine four nine four zero six nine four. Congratulations. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Stay tuned for more. Feel free to talk to our vendors at the back before they're completely packed up.